I work with a company called the Dignitas Agency. I'm actually going to go to that slide. And um, one of the things that we do is we work specifically with underrepresented uh, populations and around leadership development. And one of the things that we talk about is the things you guys just experienced in that exercise, the things that are said, the things that are thought, the ways that we are positioned lower than, the ways that we're excluded in really subtle ways and sometimes in obvious ways. And the one thing that we say is there will always be circumstances be powerful anyway. And so that's the model that we work in. And so one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today is this idea of what power is and how do you access it and how do you stay in touch with it because that's the only way that you'll lead. And if you're not in touch with that, you won't lead. You'll do something else. And so that's where, that's where, where I'm going to kind of pick up in the conversation. So knowing that we have these circumstances out there that are listed on this piece of paper, how do we be powerful anyway? So um, one of the things that I was noticing as I was listening to uh, the panel and then also to some of the things that Suzanne was pointing to is that I think I have a little bit of a different story than a lot of people that may look like me. And uh, one of the things that has shaped that story is I played basketball from the time I was 10 years old. And when you're good at something, people pay attention to you. And when they pay attention to you, they find they're doing that because they see something in you that they either recognize or they want in their life. And when that happens, they automatically start to bring you along. They say, hey, let me tell you this, or hey, let me show you this, or did you know about this? So you start to have information and people show up in your life in ways that other people don't. So part of what I'm, where I'm talking to you from is this place of wanting to help all of us become better allies for all of us, but then also as someone who has had a lot of allyship in their life, and I think that shaped the way that I show up in the world. And so what I mean by that is um, one of the things that I learned very early on from my family and the messaging that I got, Suzanne talked about language and how important it is. What I heard a lot was, you can do whatever you want. And so I've always had this sense of agency. And my whole problem is getting out of my own way. Because deep down, I hear that when I hear the voices in my head from the people that told me stories or told me who I was, it was that you can do whatever you want. And so that's part of the reason I do this work about breakthrough beliefs is because I feel like I'm still in my own way around other messages that I've heard. But in my particular situation, it was around agency and how to get that. And so I think I can be an ally to people around that. Um, another thing that I heard a lot or that allies did for me was they actually helped me dream. So they helped expand my experience by telling me what was possible. I remember when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, sorry. I remember the spot on the gym floor where I was working with my basketball coach, and he said, you know, if you do this long enough and you, pay, and you get really good at this and you work hard, you can go to college and they will pay for it. And I was like, really? And he said, yes. And I said, even the University of Hawaii? And he said, even the University of Hawaii. <laughs> and so that was the first time I thought that this thing that I just did for fun and hanging out could actually create another dream for me. And all along, there were people that were setting that expectation for me. So as it turns out, I played basketball. It went well, and I ended up at Stanford. My junior year, my coach sits down with us, and she says, and by the way, when I came to Stanford, we were a 500 team. And uh, by the time I was a junior, we were ranked in the top 20 or so. And she said to us that first day of practice, she said, we're going to win a national championship. Again, someone painting a vision that I didn't have and showing me how to actually do something. And what I learned there was how to do hard things really quickly. And so a lot of what I'm bringing into this conversation are those dreams and those places where allies um, just saw something for me that I couldn't yet see for myself. And so that's one of the things I hope you'll take away is that when you see somebody and you see something in them, tell them. When you see what's possible in a way that they can't, tell them because it matters. So that's one, one easy way to be an ally for someone. Um, one of the other things, that, there's a couple things I wanted to get in the room as it, people were talking. Oh, so this basketball thing. One of the things that was also really useful in my life is that I learned how to compete. And I didn't even know that that was going to be useful until I got into the workforce. And people started asking you to perform. And they started asking you to deliver and get results. And what I'm noticing is that a lot of people 
don't actually know how to design their effort to get a particular outcome. And that's actually one of the things I learned in basketball, and I didn't realize it at the time. So one of the things that's really helpful as an ally, if you guys are in a position where you understand how the game is played, if you understand what gets valued and what gets rewarded, if you can help other people understand that because they may not have had someone in their life that has shown them how to do that or talked to them about how to do that. So that's another way that, I, that you know, allies for me have been particularly useful, and I think everybody in this room can do the same for others. So um, just know that these are, you know, I gave you those as examples because I think in a lot of ways, I'm still trying to figure out how to be a much better ally from my places of privilege. And those are four that I think have been really useful to people, and I'm trying to actually share that out. And I think all of us can kind of look for those places to say, well, where have I figured something out, and where can I actively go out and share that with someone else? And the places where I think I'm figuring some things out are in these areas, how to help people transform limiting beliefs to breakthrough beliefs, um, how to actually um, start someplace and get to somewhere else very, very quickly in a step level way instead of an incremental way. And then also, finally, how to be a happy high achiever. So how to have a broad enough life context that everything that you do actually has meaning and purpose and value so that when you fail, it's always in service of something. And when you win, it's always in service of something. And you just have a much better experience in your life. So those are the kind of the places where I orbit. And um, today, we're going to sit kind of in this place around limiting beliefs and breakthrough beliefs. Because one of the things that we do in this model is we are trying to help people realize where they stop or where they, their, their view is very sh uh, shallow or limited. And it has them think that something's not possible. And to bring more information into their, their field of vision so that they know that something is possible. So for us, the way we define a limiting belief is anything that has you focused on what you can't or what's hard or what the circumstances are. So we just went through this exercise where it's like, wow. People are saying that in the world. People are feeling that in the world. I have to hear that in the world. And sometimes that can feel hard and limiting. And there's also a broader perspective that says it doesn't have to matter. And so what, what you'll see in this chart is we go through a series of standard limitations that all humans have. One of them is I can't. Well, a breakthrough belief would be I'm capable. So a breakthrough belief doesn't make a limiting belief untrue. It just makes it irrelevant. Something may be hard. But if you're someone who does hard things, then it becomes irrelevant that it's hard. So that's what we try to help people do is just open up to um, what's possible instead of the challenges around what is. So today, um, we're living in a world where we've got things changing. Uh, demographically, we knew this was coming. Our country's sh shaping up in different ways. And that's creating a couple things that at least I'm witnessing in the, in the broader environment and in, in corporations. And one is... Um, that there's this focus on business growth. I'm into conversations now where when we talk about diversity and inclusion, people aren't talking about it as, yes, there's this thing that we're supposed to do because we have it on our website and people are going to want to come here because we have it on our website and let's not put any budget against it, which is what happens a lot. What I'm hearing now are people being really strategic about it in the sense that they're actually moving the DNI role out of HR in some cases and pairing it with supply chain. So not only, are we, not only are we hiring for diversity, but we're actually putting pressure on the system to bring diversity to us. So they're saying to people, if you're a marketing team, if you don't have at least 50% women and 30% people of color, you cannot bid. So now if we can't find diverse talent, we're going to actually have our people who are supporting us bring diverse talent. And the whole system is working at, at it. So some of those are the conversations that we're having, and it's all tied to business growth. So as you start to think about being an ally and how to actually have more people of color um, given more equitable environments, one thing you can start to think about is what is the actual business case for diversity and inclusion? And start with revenue. And how do we bring more revenue in, and why is that important? Because when you can get to that conversation, then what happens is people start putting pressure in the supply chain. And then the whole conversation shifts. So that's one thing to think about. If you're in a position of buying power or influencing buying power, that's a fantastic way to influence the system. Um, there's this other thing that's going on where this is, there's this, a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of people who are saying, what's going to happen now that we have a more diverse, more inclusive workplace? Where am I going to lose out? Where am I going to feel uncomfortable? Where do I'm not, am I not going to know how to plug in, not know what to say? 
So part of what, uh, I love what Susan was saying, was language, Suzanne was saying, language is so important. If you can help somebody be a better ally by giving them language and not having them have to work so hard, that's helpful. And I'm saying that intentionally, knowing what that means for the conversation around emotional effort and labor, and that for us, people of color, or who are part of a marginalized group, it does take energy to do that. But think about the payoff. If they're trying and I meet them halfway, then we're going to get there faster. So if, I, if, they, if someone's showing me a good faith effort, then I'm actually going to help them out. I'm going to help them get there faster. So that's something that we can do as allies. Is we can actually explain something about reparations. We can explain something about you know, someone in a Facebook group who says, well, I don't understand why that upsets you. I'm not saying go out of your way and exhaust yourself and burn yourself out. But I am saying if you put that person in a better position to have a voice for you, then that's a way to improve allyship. So that's something we can all think about. Um, the other thing that's happening, technology. It's helping us um, get more awareness. It's lifting this veil. And I want to talk about wokeness just a little bit. Um, and I want, to re I want to broaden the definition of it because I think for some of us, um, it means very specifically knowing about the history and the context of oppression and how that plays out in everyday life. Now, for others of us who have lived in this world looking like me, that also means, wow, we're catching up. So for me, this is a new conversation. And wokeness can actually be, for some people, trauma. It's... it's actually realizing that the world is not what you thought it was. And that's how I came to this conversation. So for anybody who's feeling like they're not black enough, haven't been in this conversation long enough, not whatever enough, just know that wherever you are, welcome. Because, um, and, and to not be made wrong for that, because I think that happens often. And I think if allyship is about figuring out ways to, for all of us to feel supported and all of us to get on board and move faster. So I just wanted to open it up there. And the, and the last thing I want to say around wokeness is that I was in a conversation two days ago with um, some folks from Boise, Idaho. And most of the, half of the group was white, a mix of everybody else. And what I saw in that room was um, important. And what I saw in that room was a conversation where we had um, divided up into a group uh, exercise where there were flip charts on, on the walls and there were labels. And one of the things that we did, we, every time you get to labels, we're, we're intentionally creating mess and provoking people. We knew that. But what we did in this particular workshop is we had um, a label for white. We had a label for black and Latin, Latinx, and we had LGBTQI, and we had men. But we did not have a label for women. And what happened in that space was that a lot of white women were for the first time confronting their own feelings around being labeled as white and not having a space to go to as a woman. And it, and it was provocative for them. And I would say for a lot of them, they got woke that, on Thursday. And they got woke to the fact that there is discomfort that they didn't even realize was possible. And so that's important, too. Technology is helping that out. And so anytime someone gets to that place, um, remember what it was like to feel out of place, different, not understood, and try to understand that story as well. So from the majority who is also getting woke, please try to be open and compassionate and, and willing to engage from that place as well so that they're able to be a better ally from their experience of otherness. And I'm going to move really quickly here to get to this last piece, which is changing social norms. And this is why I think language and um, being um, better capable in these conversations is really important. It's because these conversations are finding you. You may want to hide out and not have these <laughs> discussions, but they're finding you. And, and they're finding leaders and CEOs. They're finding businesses. They're finding individuals. Um, you will find yourself in a conversation in a position where you have to choose. Am I going to take a stand for something or am I not? And that's really where I want to enter into the, the, the conversation right now is um, really, really, really understanding that we are having a much broader topical range of conversations inside of the workplace, and some of those feel divisive and risky, and we're all going to be at a place where now that there is more awareness and more wokeness, we're going to have an integrity issue. Are we who we say we are? And that's really where, where we're going next. So... 
it's about not just claiming allyship. And I think this is what Joe said. You don't get to declare yourself in the video. You don't get to declare yourself an ally. It's actually about what are you doing? And does someone else witness you as an ally? And so part of what we talk to people around this journey of being witnessed as an ally is what's the difference in the distinction between intention, action, and results? So intention is, yes, I want to be this person in the world. Action is, I'm actually trying to be this person in the world. A result is, is I have evidence that can be corroborated from someone else that I have had this result in the world. And that's really what we're talking about because this journey is much harder than it starts in, or that, than it feels like on the beginning of it. And what I've seen is that people very well intended jump into this and it's just too much. It becomes too much. And so part of what I want to talk to you about now is how do you manage that? How do you manage it so that we can shrink it so that it doesn't feel too much so you stay in the arc of the journey? So you have to be clear about where, what you're willing to risk for and what you're not and why. And when that moment comes, how do you assess the moment? Because that moment can go like this. So you kind of have to already know. Otherwise, you're not going to do anything. But until you actually act in alignment with the thing you say you will stand for, you don't actually know. To the degree that you have a gap between what you say you stand for and the actual evidence in the world of that, that that exists, you will not take a stand. So the job of an ally is to close that gap. It's to actually do the thing that you say you're going to stand for. That's the only way you'll close the gap. That's the only way you'll act when the stakes are a little bit higher. Whether that means interjecting in a conversation, whether it means um, being willing to put someone forward who might not fit the exact profile that you know is going to lead to success and get you know, hired, but you're willing to risk and create space for that person, whether um, uh, I was on a conversation the other day with a client and her boss, and her boss says in this conversation, and by the way, they're both diversity, uh, HR and diversity and inclusion. The boss, the HR manager says, someone left the reservation. And I'm like, I didn't even know that language is, was still in circulation. So in the moment, I'm like, what does an ally, someone who says they stand for anti-oppression, do in this moment? And because I had never met this woman again, I had to make a, I know I had, to, I had to, or before I had to make a choice. And it wasn't just me; it was the impact that I was going to have on my the leader that I was coaching. So, you, you know, these are the moments that we're talking about. It's like, what do you do in those moments, and how do you do them, and what's your plan for that? And I'll come back to that example in a little bit. But these things happen. They don't, you don't have to go looking for them. They will find you. Um, so get ready. That's, I guess, the point is get ready so you, so you are ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready, right? That's the phrase. So start practicing now in these little moments so that when they come, you're ready for them. So let's talk. I'm going to turn up the notch again. And I want to say that... Um, we need to start talking about activism in this conversation and um, what that means or what it doesn't mean and how we relate to it because language, as Suzanne was talking about, is extremely powerful. And the general you know, kind of sense of activism out there is that it has some tinge of political or um, social change or power. And by the way, we weren't supposed to be talking about that work at, in the first place, right? So it's inappropriate in a lot of, in a lot of places prior to today, right? So knowing that, I want to introduce you guys to a concept called stereotype threat. Who's familiar with stereotype threat in the room? I just want to, OK, great. So I want to remind you guys of a concept called stereotype threat, which is that if there is a point of view out there about something or that you're associated with or that is a characteristic of you, you will do everything in your power not to live into that stereotype of that thing. So if people think women are too emotional, then I'm going to make sure that I do not show up emotional in that space because I know that negative projection is going to come onto me. So what I want you guys to keep in mind is that if you call yourself an activist, you are someone who cares about activating something, you may be conscious of, of even wanting that label or claiming that label, but unconsciously, you may be getting in your own way because you know that people out there will not feel the same about that label. So there are ways that people in this room can hold themselves back unintentionally around that. So right. when you call yourself an ally, I mean, sorry, an activist, that word 
may actually have you underperform as an ally. So just, yeah. just think about it that way. Um, and what I want to do is actually reposition this and say, you know, keep stepping into that word. Because I think you are only an ally if you are an activist. And what I mean by that, and, and, and if we're not willing to step into that word of activist, then we're leaving power on the table. And what I mean by that is that I think an activist is just someone who takes a step in the direction of something that's important to them. So if we neutralize that word and own it like that and have a way to explain it like that when someone says, you're just an activist, you're such an activist, instead of falling into that stereotype third around it, we can say, yes, and let me tell you what that means for me and move confidently in that direction if we're not afraid of that being the label that gets attached to us. Make sense? Okay. All right, I'm going to move us along. Tell me what you think about this slide. Can you guys see, can you guys see this slide? Um, is it big enough? Or can, do I need to make it bigger? You guys get it? I, I, can you guys see back there, Samaya? OK. So yeah, I'm just going to let you see what you see for a minute. <laughs> this comes from uh, one of the groups that I work with, uh, Enact Leadership. They do a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion work, a lot of uh, unconscious bias work. And this is a slide that, that comes from them. So um, the thing that I'm also seeing that gets people to stop is when they encounter a situation and someone says, well, what do you mean equity? It's a fair, you know, everybody gets the same shot. This is a meritocracy. What do you mean your experience is different than mine? I work just as hard as you. What do you mean you're at a disadvantage? My life was hard too. So these are the th places where if we don't have good answers or good understanding or broad spectrum of uh, language and response items for these types of questions, we'll go away from the conversation. So one of the things that I like to um, have people think about is what are, the, what are the questions that you actually don't want to receive? This comes from consulting, I guess. You know, what's the worst question a client can ask you in the moment? Um, and, and spend time there. So whatever you're looking at in this slide that has you feel antsy or like, oh my goodness, I hope she doesn't ask me what I think about that, spend time there. Just get a little bit more perspective on that. And not just your own or the people that agree with you, but what is someone on the other end of the spectrum think about this? And how can you actually speak to this from a place that, ha that both increases understanding and allows you to be more influential in the point of view that you have? Because when we can do that, then we don't have the imposter syndrome. When we can do that, then we don't worry that someone's going to say you don't know what you're talking about. When we can do that, we can actually broaden the conversation. And so I had a situation in Boise uh, on Thursday where, as I mentioned, we were in this room about this size, about this number of people. Um, half of the group was white. And on that debrief around uh, the, the women that were in the group of white people, were, they were having a, an awakening moment and talking about how hard it was for them to label themselves as white and to be in that, and that it was much more comfortable for them to label themselves as women and to talk about what was hard or challenging or wonderful about that. And as one person was reporting out, she said, you know, I notice myself as a woman living in Boise, Idaho, but I don't notice myself as a white person living in Boise, Idaho. And she was telling her truth. And from the other side of the room, you could see, hear some people starting to shut down. I could hear them shutting down. I was not looking at them. I could hear it and feel it. And then two, two, two comments later, someone says, well, what about reparations? Are you gonna, I just want to know, are you going to admit that you did something wrong? So I'm in Boise, Idaho, remember? Remember that part? So half the room is like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you just said. So part of what happened is this slide came up, right? This, the, that conversation is this slide. And most of the people didn't know how to talk about this slide in the room. And the person that was bringing this into the room, he had a point of view, and he, had, and he knew why he was coming from that place. But all he was able to do in that moment was be angry. And part of what happened, oh, by the way, did I mention the police chief was there with four officers? Oh. Right. Yeah, it was that type of room. It was fantastic. It was actually a lot of, so what happened in that moment, and by the way, the police chief was the one that brought us together. The police chief and the president of the NAACP, they created this moment in the room. 
So what happened was he's angry. She's like, oh, my goodness, what did I just say? I did not mean, I, what did I just say? She is, she's completely blind to this. And so I look at him and I said, can you please explain what you mean? Because I knew this group didn't know it. So he tried, and he couldn't quite get there because he's angry. And by the way, he is on the spectrum. He's actually not trying to be accommodating. He's trying to shut everything down because that, that is the radical point of view that he's coming from. And so I'm sitting here trying to make everybody right, going, oh, my goodness. And while I'm figuring out how to do this, the police chief says, he looks at this gentleman, and he says, I want to know more about what you're thinking and you're feeling right now. And I want you to come to my office, and we're going to have a conversation. And so I pa after that, I paused, and I said, in this room, did you guys hear what just happened here? He got, a, he got an invitation. And when you get an invitation, you do not turn it down. I have a really strong point of view around that because I actually care about bridging and, and opening up the conversation and having movement. So what I'm going to say to you guys as allies, wherever you are in that spectrum, whatever your point of view is, if you get an invitation to the, to the conversation with someone in power, don't make that power wrong. Show up at that table and share exactly what you need that person in power to hear. And that's what I talked with that young man about later. I said, I'm not asking you to change your fire or mute it or any of that. What I'm asking you is to understand how to walk him through how you got to where you are so that he can understand it and he can hear it. Otherwise, what's going to happen is he's going to be on that left side thinking, hey, we're in the same race. We've got the same scenario. I can't see it. So if we're going to change this, we have to be able to let in broader conversations. We have to bring in broader perspectives, and we have to show up to the table when power invites us, even if we have a problem with that power. And so that's what I want to say to all of us who actually care about this stuff. Don't get caught in your own stuff, because otherwise nothing changes. And that can happen when you feel strongly about something. We can get in our own way around it. All right, I'm going to move us forward. Um, there's a spec this also comes from an act leadership. Um, this was a spectrum that I was trying to consider when I was in that room when the woman said this person left the reservation. Um, it says active participation to active prevention, and this is around um, oppression. So in every moment when we're faced with a, a chance to take a stand and be an ally, we're going to have to consider this spectrum. The more you know about what you stand for, under what circumstances, uh, what that looks like, the way that you've done it in the past, you have a toolkit to bring it into the future, the better you're going to be able to navigate the spectrum because you're going to have more scenarios, more reps, more competence. So that's why I want you to be really clear about what you stand for and to be able to articulate it and have examples so that we can be better operating along the spectrum. And by the way, if we end up being like I was in that, that conversation, somewhere in the middle where I recognized something was not okay and I didn't take action, I was being intentional about it in the moment, and I'm going to circle back later with this woman once we've had relationship and I've built rapport because I have three more and opportunities to meet with her. And, and I don't want to disadvantage my leader by jumping into a conversation where someone doesn't have trust with me. So it's, you can actually navigate this in different ways once you know that these are all your options and you have examples of where you use this in the past and you feel confident in it. Oh, let me back up. Here's what I want you to know about allyship, too. In those moments when you're uncertain and you think that everybody knows more about this than you do, I want you to remember that in any given situation, 10% of the people are going to be heroes, 10% are going to be villains, and everybody else is waiting to see what you're going to do. So just leaning in the direction of heroism will make a difference. And so those small steps, those places where you're making room for other people, they matter, even if you, can't, even if you don't think you're the expert. And then finally, um, I'm just going to ask you to, to think about, you know, in the context of this conversation, what we've been talking about, what are you willing to risk for? So as you say you're someone who is an ally, who might be, even be an activist, who had, takes a stand for something or wants to, how, do you, how, how far will you go on that spectrum? How far will you be from, you know, anti-participation to actually anti or active or prevention? Will you get all the way to active prevention? Um, and that's a very, very personal question, and a lot of things come into it, and I don't think any, there is a right answer, and I think it changes. But to just hold that in your head and get more familiar with where you're at on it will have you be a better ally.
I want you guys to be thinking about um, what you stand for. There's a, on the other page, the last page, there's actually one more box, what I stand for. And as, I, as I'm reading this close, I want you guys to think about what that answer is, knowing my definition of stand, like that you're actually willing to risk on behalf of this thing um, in order to move things forward. So sometimes silence is not just silence, but it's a choice. Sometimes patience is in wisdom, but in a time of chaos and uncertainty, it's an ab abdication of responsibility and accountability. Think about a time when you remained silent and now wish you had said something. Think about a time when you remained patient and now wish you had acted. Think of a time when you maintained or remained neutral and now wish you had taken a stand. Who do you want to be and take that stand? 